For the following functions, we have to find f composed with g. In this case, I have f of x is x squared, and g of x equals square root of x. Remember, this is like half an I'm a little teapot. We've got a square root function. So the domain on my g of x is going to go from 0 to positive infinity. Remember, we can only take the square root of positive numbers. Next, I'm going to find the composite function. f composed with g of x is f of g of x, which is the square root of x squared, which is x. Are there any restrictions on this? No, there are no restrictions, x, um, no additional restrictions. This is a linear function, right? Typically, its domain is all real numbers. But remember that I need my domain to contain the restrictions from step one and step two. So where do 0 to infinity and negative infinity to positive infinity overlap? Well, that's going to be from, negative, from 0 to infinity. What if you weren't sure? Well, one way you could do this is to draw a number line. Just a really simple number line. So, and for that, we could try and see where our domains intersect, i.e., where they overlap. So, we'll draw the domain of our first function. My, that domain goes from zero all the way to positive infinity. If we draw the domain of the composite function, well, before we look at restrictions, right, we have negative infinity to positive infinity. So, there we would look and see where they overlap. And that would give me a domain from 0 to positive infinity, i.e. where is there green and orange. All right, let's look at another example that's a little more complicated and works with a complex fraction. So first, I want to know where my restrictions on g of x. Well, x can't equal 0, right? Second. I want to find my composite function. Hold on to your hard hats. If I have f composed with g of x, so f of g of x, that equals 3 times 2 over x. Again, I'm substituting in g of x in for x in f over 2 over x minus 1. That gives me 6x over 2x minus, instead of 1, let's write that as x over x, so we can simplify our numerator 1 fraction, simplify our denominator 1 fraction, and then divide them. So I have 6 over x over 2 minus x over x. Now let's rewrite this as division. When I'm dividing fractions, I keep my first fraction the same. I change from division to multiplication, and I flip my second fraction. So I get x over 2 minus x. When I multiply these across, my x are going to cancel. So I have 6 over 2 minus x. This is our composite function. We did it. Yay! What are the restrictions there? Well, I can't have this equal to 0. So if I subtract 2 from both sides, negative x equals negative 2, i.e. x can't equal 2. So the domain of my composite function has to include our original exclusion in step 1. So the domain is all values of x such that x doesn't equal 0 and x doesn't equal 2. I hope that finding the domains of composite uh, functions is becoming a little more clear as we work through more and more examples. Our last example is going to be the most complicated, so I am going to try and take it pretty slow. So let's find f composed with g. So g of x in this case is the square root of x minus 1. That means that my x value has to be, if I was talking about the domain of g of x, all my x values have to be greater than or equal to negative 1, sorry, greater than or equal to positive 1, or x has to be less than or equal to negative 1, right? If I have a number greater than 1, 
such as 1.1 or 1.4 or 2, that's going to make sure I'm always taking the square root of a positive number. Same thing with the negatives. The negatives are included because I'm squaring. If I square a negative, I get a positive number. And it has to be greater than or equal to negative 1 because negative 1 squared is 1. So that's our step 1 domain. Next, we find our composite function. So I'm going to take f composed with g of x, and that means I get the square root of the square root of x squared minus 1 minus 2. Now I know this looks ugly, but this is actually its correct form. But now I know that what's inside this square root radical always has to be greater than 0, so I can find the restrictions on our composite domain. This always has to be greater than or equal to 0, so I can add 2 to both sides. That gives me that the square root of x squared minus 1 always has to be greater than or equal to 2. We could square the both sides to get rid of the radical. So I get x squared minus 1 is greater than or equal to 2, so x squared minus 1 it we add 1 to both sides. So x squared is greater than or equal to pause. Oh, this becomes a 4. Sorry. 2 squared is 4. Add 1. 5. Now I can take the square root of both sides, remembering that I get the positive square root and the negative square root. So x is going to be greater than the square root of 5, but x also has to be less than or equal to the negative square root of 5. So let's look at where these two domains overlap, and I'm going to do that with a number line. Oh, look, I have this convenient line here. Why have I never thought to use this as a number line before? Oh my gosh. Live and learn. Okay, so let's graph our original domain, which was x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Sorry, greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to negative 1. And again, we're looking for the intersection. We're looking where these overlap. Next, in orange, I'm going to graph our second restrictions that we found in step 3. So x has to be greater than or equal to a positive square root of 5, which is like 2.3, by the way. Or x has to be greater or equal, less than or equal to the negative square root of 5. So where do these overlap? They overlap where it's orange. So the domain of f composed with g in this case, in our final example for section 4.1, is um, x has to be greater than or equal to the square root of 5, or x is less than or equal to the negative square root of 5. So I hope these um, extra examples helped clarify a few things on how to find the domains of composite functions.